we're going to take a look at one more hardware emulation, and that is going to be a plugin which is called Dext, which is uh, technically it's a DX7 editor, but it's also an emulator because it will make its own sound. So if you actually have a DX7, you can load patches into Dext, make some adjustments to them, and then send them back to the instrument. And the reason you'd want to do that is because actually programming this instrument, the actual physical instrument, is virtually impossible. There are only a handful of people who really understand it and can really do, um, or what I should say, they can really get the sound out of it that they're looking for. I personally cannot do that it's like the most tedious and frustrating thing because just look at this actual instrument you can see there's one little LED there's not like a filter cut off there's not a lot of knobs there's not a lot of intuitive controls where's our envelopes all I'm seeing is this crazy diagram at the top and what am I supposed to do with that how do I know what that means well we're going to talk about it a little bit here but really in this course the emphasis and the focus is on the sound so this is released three years after 1982 it's released three years after the Oberheim OBX was released and that OBX actually did have microprocessors inside of it it's what allowed for the multiple voices to be played back but with this instrument what you have under the hood is really just an early computer that's all it is it's 100% digital so you can buy a DX7 today for like under $200 they were mass produced they're very cheap to get your hands on now but I wouldn't really call this an analog sound. So this is interesting. We have a hardware emulation of something that is completely digital to start with. So that's very different from what we were just looking at before, but it's still a hardware emulation. So let's go ahead, jump back into our DAW and take a look at this instrument and listen to what it sounds like. So here it is, we are now looking at Dext. And just like with the OBXD, this instrument is also polyphonic and it's pretty easy for it to be polyphonic because this is all digital. So they can just use like a microprocessor, they can use a chip and then it allows for multiple voices to be played at the same time, as you can hear. We can play those multiple voices back. So by looking at this, it really is very intimidating to look at, but the theory and the principle behind it isn't that complicated. In the bonus section of the first course, I actually talk a lot about phase modulation and frequency modulation synthesis to give you an idea, but I'm just going to show you again, this time with our SPAN plugin, which we couldn't look at before when we were working um, in the first course. So you can see that we're starting here with just a basic sine wave, right? That's our sine wave. That is what this instrument initializes to, but it's capable of a lot more than that because you're able to actually modulate this sine wave with another frequency, something that is in an audible range. And when you modulate something at FM, frequency modulation, um, something that we can actually hear uh, as compared to a low frequency oscillator, which we can't hear, then you're going to generate what's known as sidebands. So when you're modulating something really, really fast, it actually will start to add these sidebands. And I can actually show that to you, but to do that, I need to pick an algorithm that's actually going to have a uh, carrier modulator relationship. And this first one does. So so right now, all we're hearing is number one. That's a carrier. And number three would also be a carrier. Everything else is a modulator. It's not going to just output sound on its own. If I turn number one off and I turn number two on and I play notes, you can see that we're seeing something, but we're not hearing anything. And that's because number two is a modulator. It is not a carrier. If I go to an algorithm where number two is a carrier, which I think there's one towards the end here. Here's one then you can see that I'm hearing number two. But let's go back to that first algorithm because it's going to work for us just fine here. And if I go ahead and I bring back in number one, let's make sure we can see it. As I start to bring in the level from number two, you're going to hear sidebands start to be generated, okay? And you're going to see them as well. So now number two is modulating number one. It's currently at, I believe, a one-to-one -one ratio here. No detune. So we're actually modulating uh, number one by the exact same frequency as number two. And we're going to see what sort of harmonics pop up here. So right now, what we're actually doing is following the harmonic series, okay? So this the note I'm playing was an F. The next note that comes up is an F. 
followed by a C, etc. We could go up this whole thing and we're just following the harmonic series. That's the real basics behind this instrument. But if I wanted, I could totally change the sidebands based on what I am modulating this carrier with. And I can change that up here. So you hear what we have now. Let's change this course to something like nine. That's really annoying. Let's actually go down to like three and then detune it, which is going to make it sound even more out of tune. It's actually going to start adding harmonics. Um, it's starting to add partials and not harmonics. So it's adding sidebands that are not related to the fundamental. And the more level we put in here, the harder the modulation. So at the top, So the basic idea here is that we no longer need a filter because with a subtractive synthesizer, we build up that block first and then we take things away. With an FM or a PM synthesizer like we have here and like existed on the DX7, the idea is kind of the opposite. It's that you can use these different operators here, which is what they're referred to as, to actually add harmonics and take them away, assuming you have different envelopes that can be used. So this is where you have to be very careful if you're using this instrument and you're editing it yourself manually these envelopes are very tricky so just be aware of that so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add in here some attack and I'm going to add in uh, some release to it to start and let's add some actual release to our uh, carrier here so now if I play this back let's turn the level off we have what sounds like a bell but now what I'm gonna do is bring this in and I'm going to hold the note down. And you're going to hear that we're going to get some harmonics coming in. Let's increase that level all the way to the top. Then you can hear it fade away. If I don't have any release, this is always kind of interesting. You're going to hear that this cuts off like immediately. Those overtones just go off and you just hear that one sine wave at the end. So here it is. So we could actually run this through like a whole ADSR envelope here. So I'm going to bring down the sustain level. And this is where it starts to get like very tricky and then mess with the decay a little bit. So let's see if we can get this right. That's really the idea behind FM and and the thought process is if you actually know how an instrument's um, like spectrum, the actual frequencies that are coming up changes over time, you can in theory emulate that using an FM synthesizer. But it's not easy and it's very hard and you need to know a lot about like math and this stuff and the idea is, you know, the, uh, the better the ratio, um, the more uh, harmonious the sound is going to be, the more that ratio gets thrown all out of the place. Like if you had like a 16 to like 3 ratio as compared to like a 1 to 2 ratio, the 1 to 2 ratio or 2 to 1 ratio is going to sound a lot more um harmonic than something that's like just all over the place a lot more consonant as compared to dissonant so uh just some of the ideas but the reason i'm showing this to you is really because i just want you to compare the sound quality of these instruments so i can go in and actually load up some presets from the original machine and that's where this is really cool and that's actually how i tend to use this thing because this is a synthesizer that was very powerful in the 80s and very popular in the 80s i should say not powerful incredibly popular in like the 80s and up to the 90s but it's rare that you would see somebody just use a dx7 so it's almost always going to be processed further so when you listen to this you're going to tell that the sound kind of seems a little bit unfinished so after you've played with this instrument for a while and then you go back and listen to you know some of your favorite 80s songs you're thinking well it doesn't sound exactly like that and no it doesn't because this instrument is just dying for like 
like reverb, for delay, for a chorus effect, but you can get that fundamental sound down kind of first, and some of these are, are real classics. So if I go into cart here, I think in this one is where I'll find the electric piano. Let's see, maybe not. Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is like the E piano. <laughs> And you can hear just how much of an impact velocity has on these. And that's because you can actually set the velocity sensitivity within each one of these guys. And it also now gives you a uh, filter too, if you want to like filter some of these upper harmonics out. So if I'm hitting really hard, I want some of those gone. really giving it so in this case i know that numbers one three and five are actually my carriers so if i want to like increase the release on this instrument i have to be really careful because i kind of have to do it with all of them That one I took too far. So this is actually a sound that you've probably heard a countless number of times, whether you know it or not. And then there's also, you know, like the really classic one here is like the bass sound. Um, we can look at the spectrum of this. So you can see that um, you can get really a really diverse sort of spectrum using FM synthesis, which you can't really do with the subtractive synthesizer that we looked at before. But of course, the tone is now very different. So here is our bass sound with uh, Dext. And we can compare that to what we had with the OBXD. Gonna go down, probably another octave. Very different sort of a tone, but again, this comes down to what sounds you're looking for and when it's gonna fit in. And so if you're going for a throwback 80s sort of sound, which is sometimes very popular in some styles of music even today, you know, going with Dext is going to be not a bad idea because you can really get that sound quickly and then you can process it in a modern way. So again, this is all about listening to the differences in sound. And again, if you're just new and starting out with FM synthesis, have some fun experiment, but just know that it's easy to kind of blow this thing up. So be careful. Uh, there are probably better FM synthesizers that you want to get started with, but this one is an exact emulation of the DX7 and actually sounds quite similar to it also. One final thing I wanted to show you that I forgot to show you in the actual video is how these sidebands are actually generated and the difference between, for example, low frequency oscillation and then just regular frequency oscillation. So an audible frequency and with our hearing that's 20 Hertz up to 20,000 Hertz. So right now I'm playing A4440. Okay, we can see that like so, A4440, that's what we have right now. And I'm gonna go ahead and use our uh, modulator here, number two, and I'm gonna put it into fixed. And when I put it into fixed, you can actually see that we get a Hertz control. So right now, what I'm actually doing is using an LFO, all right? This is below our range of human hearing. This is at one Hertz. We can't start hearing until around 20 or 30 Hertz. So if I play this now and put the level all the way up, you can hear and actually see this thing moving around. It's a low frequency oscillator. We're starting to get what would be like a vibrato effect. And as I increase this, it's gonna go faster. But you can still hear that there's just movement happening. As we increase this, as I bring the course up, we'll be able to now start to hear uh, once we get over 20 hertz, the sideband's being generated. So you can start to see it here. And as I go even further, we're getting 
targeting some of these sidebands. And actually at 109, this is starting to sound pretty good. And that's because we're playing at 440, A4, 440. And if we go down the octaves, right, it's A3 is 220, A2 is actually 110 if we're just going by the multiple. So that's why this sounds really good. But if I play a different note, it's not going to sound as good. So I can actually bring up the uh, keyboard here if you want to see that. So if I'm not playing an A, you can see that difference. So if I bring the course tuning up again, I should be able to actually lock this in here at 440. So now we're actually modulating um, the carrier by itself at 440. So it should sound really nice. But again, if I play somewhere else because I'm in fixed mode, not going to sound as nice. And if I move this around, kind of changes. I could put it at 880 and that should sound pretty good. Etc, etc, etc. So that's the idea behind the sidebands and how they're generated.